afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Holliston Senior Center. We're very pleased that Attorney Bergeron has come back again um, to speak with us today about Elder Law 101, um, some of the changes affecting elders with the current climate out there. Uh, so we welcome and thank you all for coming. And thank you very much for inviting me back. It's, it's our pleasure. I really appreciate it. First one of 2017, which Excellent. I really appreciate. Happy uh, St. Patrick's Day almost, everybody. And you're coming back Does, again? Doesn't, yes, in a couple, I think another month or two. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. So, so today, thank you very much. You're I welcome. appreciate it. So today, um, what I try to do annually is to do a one-on-one -on -one presentation, which is a general presentation. It has a ton of information in it. I tend to go fast because I'm just trying to alert you and the folks who are watching at home that to, to all, kind of all the issues as seniors that you may be wanting to think about. This is really designed for folks who are... Who are 65 or older, right? Um, and then what I try to do in the later presentations is do individual things in more detail. What I'm gonna try to do at the, in the next one, for those of you who are, who are here, um, is to focus on these proposed changes to the mass health regulations. I'm gonna talk about them a little bit today, but they haven't changed yet. So uh, I'm, I, we're still wondering whether this is really going to happen. There were a proposed of a series of very, very significant changes to the regulations significant in terms of affecting your ability to qualify for mass health if you're a senior, whether you need nursing home care or need a lot of care at home. Uh, they were proposed in November of last year. The public hearing was in December. I testified with some others really talking about how bad these were going to be in terms of keeping people from qualifying. Um, and, I th and there was actually been legislation pa um, filed um, um, by a number of legislators who were concerned about the impact here in Massachusetts. And in response, I think, to all of that, MassHealth kind of pulled back. They were supposed to be, they had originally said they were going to implement these uh, the first week of February. And the last we heard was the end of February, they were saying, well, we're still taking comments and we're considering this and biddy bee, biddy bo, biddy bop. So we're really kind of not sure. So hopefully by the time of the next presentation, I'll know, we'll know what regulations have actually been changed. So for today, um, this is the 101 presentation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us, um, 40 of us in Worcester and 20 in Westboro, about. Um, there's more than that, but I always, they, we, they keep coming. We keep growing. So um, because there are so many of us, I get to do, and we each get to do kind of what we like doing because there's enough of us that we, each of us can focus on something. So this is what I do. I do nothing but elder law. Uh, I have been practicing now for 40 years. I find this hard to believe. But anyway, um, what the people that I talk about are, are typically people like my friends Frank and Mary and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. If you haven't been here before, you've, then that's kind of the basic family that I talk about. Frank and Mary have a very simple goal in life. They want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. It's very simple. Uh, and, if they, and after they die, they want to take their assets. If one of them dies, all things being equal, they want to give everything to the other one. And if the two of them are dead, they want to leave everything to their kids. Uh, but their questions are, is, you know, how do they make all of that happen? And how do they make sure that they don't go broke before they die? Which is their most important, although often unstated, um, uh, condition of all of this is we don't want to be broke, right? I mean, if the kids get something, that's great. But we want to make sure that there's enough until we die. Um, their assets look like this. Um, they have a home that's worth $300,000. He has an IRA of, worth $150,000. She's named as the death beneficiary. The kids are named as the, as the alternates. Um, he, has an, uh, he has an annuity worth $100,000. She's named as the beneficiary, death beneficiary. The kids are named as the alternate. They have joint bank accounts, so they have $625,000 in assets. Uh, he's getting Social Security of $1,500 and a pension of five for a total of $2,000 a month. She's getting half of his, 750. So between the two of them, they're making $2,750 a month, a little more than $30,000 a year. They're not rich, but they're not poor. They've got no mortgage. They're gonna be okay, unless there's a major uh, um, health issue that involves nursing homes or a lot of care at home, right? Because they're on Medicare, so most kinds of medical problems, Medicare is gonna take care of it. So when they come in and they're asking me, so what do I need to do? Don't I, what, what legal documents do I need to have? Don't I need a will? Um, the answer is actually no. Um, in this case, as long as this is exactly um, the situation, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, I'll say what you really need, and it's really cheap, right? And you gotta have it, are a healthcare proxy, a most form, and a power of attorney. 
Um, raise your hand if you know what a most form is. That's zero out of the number of people here. That's about average for the number of people who know this. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, M-O-L-S-T, uh, replaced the, the uh, DNR and expanded on the DNR or do not resuscitate form. Um, first, healthcare proxy. You have to have one. You got to have one because if you're incapacitated and the doctor um, figures that you can't, aren't able to make a medical decision, there's no one who can make it for you otherwise. Your spouse is not legally entitled to make a medical decision for you. Definitely not your kids, but not even your spouse. When doctors allow that, they're cheating. And in, in today's more and more litigious world, doctors are willing to cheat less and less regarding stuff like this. So you need a healthcare proxy, even just to name your spouse, to take care of your medical decisions for you. Um, what, do you, what does it take to do a healthcare proxy? It's really simple. You need two witnesses. It doesn't have to be notarized. Um, um, and, and those witnesses can be uh, anybody except one of the people that you've named in the proxy. Um, you can name anybody that you want as your proxy, um, except you, you can't name a person who is actually working for the hospital where you are. Um, that proxy can only act for you to make medical decisions and then only if your doctor has said in writing that you're incapable of making a medical decision. That's the only power that the proxy has, okay? And when the doctor makes that determination, by the way, that you can't make a medical decision, that's the only determination he's making. And the reason why I mention that is that regularly in nursing homes and in assisted living and in the hospitals, I get nurses and doctors who, who say, oh, the, the, they, th this patient can no longer sign any documents here um, because the doctor has invoked the healthcare proxy. That is, made the determination under the healthcare proxy law, which is only a determination that that person can't make a medical decision. Now, the fact that a person can't make it, that you can't make a medical decision, because those are complicated, right? Doesn't mean that you can't name somebody to, to, uh, to act on your behalf to handle your legal affairs through a power of attorney. Doesn't mean you can't sign a will. Doesn't mean you, can't, doesn't mean you don't have the competence to sign a deed. But there has become this myth that has evolved that w once the healthcare proxy has been invoked that you can't do anything. And by the way, you always have the right to revoke your healthcare proxy. The statute that creates the healthcare proxies that allows for healthcare proxies specifically says that for purposes of deciding whether you can revoke the proxy, there's no question about whether you're competent. You're always competent to revoke your proxy. Okay, so you're not giving away this huge amount of responsibility or power by signing a healthcare proxy. It's really important to have one. Once you've done one, this is a question that commonly comes up. So if I sign this healthcare proxy, does this mean that my daughter or my son can admit me to a nursing home without me wanting to? Well, technically, yes. Well, no. Technically, the, the decision to be admitted to a nursing home or to admit one to a nursing home is a medical decision. And therefore, if the doctor has said, that you're medically incapable of, of making a medical decision, that you're not competent, then the person with the proxy can say you should be going into the nursing home. However, if you get to the nursing home with your daughter who wants you to go in and, and you say, I don't want to be here. Legally, what you just did is you revoked your proxy. There's actually a case on this in, in which a lady really didn't want to go to McLean's. Certainly, she had some real issues, but she didn't want to go to McLean's and, and the proxy was trying to sign her in and she said, I don't want to be here. Um, and the, and the, these people had money, so the case went up and it got decided by the Supreme Judicial Court eventually. And they said no, that her saying she didn't want to be there automatically revoked the proxy. So you're not losing that control by signing the proxy. And finally, as I mentioned to you, you can always revoke them. Um, only applies to medical decisions. As I mentioned to you, by doing this, you're not somehow eliminating your power to sign other kinds of documents if the doctor at some point says that you're not empowered to make, to figure out medical decisions, okay? Um, a little piece of trivia about he healthcare proxies is that the proxy, as opposed to your power of attorney, doesn't actually die when you do. Your proxy remains in control of your body, of your remains, for purposes of deciding whether there are going to be any organ donations from you <laughs> from your remains after you die. So if you're specifically concerned about that, you should put some language about that in your healthcare proxy document, okay? 
Uh, the MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T, once again, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Um, the MOLST form is actually not a, a for, an instruction from you to the healthcare providers to not do something or to do something. It's, a, it's an instruction from your doctor. It is a medical, the MOLST form is a medical order and therefore has to be signed by your doctor. If you want to know where the MOLST forms are, while well, you could find one, I'm sure, online, your doctor will have them. And as a matter of fact, Medicare will even pay for your doctor to talk to you about this, about filling out the MOLST form and what your decisions are regarding the stuff that's on the MOLST form, right, which I'll just talk about in a second. The main thing, and it, once again, it includes that do not resuscitate question. If, you've, if your heart has stopped, do you want the, somebody to try to start it again, like the EMT, right? Or do you want you know, that not to happen, in which case the EMT is going to try to start your heart unless you've signed a MOLST form um, and unless it's on the refrigerator. The place to put the MOLST form is on the refrigerator. Why is that? It's because all EMTs are trained when they get to the house that if you're on the floor someplace, they're supposed to look at the refrigerator to see if there's a MOLST form. And if there's not, that's, they're not going to stop looking because they're busy, because you're on the floor, and they've got to make some decisions quick, right? So if you want this thing to actually have an effect, that's where you should put it. Finally, your, your proxy, clearly in this situation, you really are incapacitated. So your proxy has the capacity to overrule any of your decisions. So you want to make sure, even if you sign the most form and said, I don't want to be resuscitated, if your daughter or son, the proxy, is there at the time and says, I want Ma resuscitated, or Dad, they're going to do it because the, they have the power to overrule. So you want to be clear with whoever you've named as your proxy as to what your feelings are about this stuff. Major issues on the form, and once again, you'd want to see the form because it has other stuff in it. But major decisions, CPR. Do you want CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation? That is the process through which they basically push down on your ribs, often pushing through your ribs um, and breaking them, and then pushing down on your heart and trying to get your heart to get going again. Right? Do you want that? Now, you want to talk to your doctor about that. You really want to think about it. I mean, among, among other things, I remember doing this presentation with a gerontologist, this wonderful woman who referred me to a study that she had seen that said, if you are over 70, it, your chances of surviving CPR by more than 30 days are 5%. 5%, right? Your chances of surviving CPR, are, of actually getting them to get you going at all, are about 25%. But then folks often just die immediately after. So, so... What you're going through here, chances are, is that you're going to end up experiencing this incredibly painful death if you're not one of the, the little percent that survives, right? So you just want to decide, kind of, you, and you need to decide this ahead of time, what you, what you want um, people to do in that case. Intubation. Intubation is taking a, a tube and putting it down your throat into your lungs so that they can blow air into your lungs because you've stopped breathing, right? And as many nurses who've worked at hospitals have told me, don't do this unless you want it to be permanent because to get somebody to stop intubating you is a whole other issue than to stop somebody from starting to intubate you, right? In terms of doc people really don't want to stop intubating people. So, so intubation, uh, my, my kind of favorite do not hospitalize. Frank and Mary want to die and be buried in the backyard, which means if they're about to die, they don't want to go to the hospital. They want to die and be buried in the backyard, right? So if you don't, because once you get to the hospital, the you know, bells start going off and people are going to save you. People are going to save you when, they're at the, when you're at the hospital. So if, if you really want to pass, you need to think about whether you want to go to the hospital. Okay, so that's um, the most form. By the way, the alternative to um, the, the, the healthcare proxy is a guardianship process. The only way that someone can get appointed to make medical decisions for you, unless you sign that proxy, which you know, costs practically nothing and is easy to do, is to get somebody, to, one of your relatives has to go spend about $10,000 and go through the probate process, and it's gonna take about two months, and if there are contesting people, it's awful. So you don't wanna do that. Power of attorney. You need, a power, you need a healthcare proxy, you need a power of attorney. The power of attorney, as opposed to the healthcare proxy, typically takes effect right away. Through the power of attorney, you are naming somebody and authorizing that person to, to, to do legal things on your behalf. 
the general power of attorney, you're empowering to do everything on your behalf except make a medical decision, like sign your checks, could sign a deed, could deal with the insurance company, to do anything that you would be doing, okay? Um, but by signing the power of attorney, you're not giving up any of your own power, as opposed to the healthcare proxy where the, you know, a doctor is saying you can't make the decision and therefore somebody else does. The power of attorney, you're keeping the ability to do all of those things. All you're doing is you're saying that this other person also has the power to do it through the power of attorney. Um, does it have to be notarized? Actually, unless you want the attorney, that your, your, your agent, who is what, what he's called, the agent through the power of attorney, um, to be able to sign a deed or a mortgage or something that gets recorded in the registry of deeds, the power of attorney does not have to be notarized. It also does, never has to be witnessed in Massachusetts. This varies by state. Um, in general, do you want it notarized? Absolutely. And why is that? Because people, it looks more official. Now, I know that sounds stupid, but you remember, the, uh, I, I always refer to the fact that my, my daughter once gave me a t-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the case of the power of attorney, the judge is not like a real judge or a lawyer even. It's like the guy at the bank who is deciding whether to accept this power of attorney and let somebody sign a check for you or your insurance agent, you know, or it's just, it's, they're random folks. And so you want to be having a doc, and there's something about a document that's notarized. I've been practicing for 40 years. I've come to appreciate that. People say, oh, I want to make sure this gets notarized. Well, why is that? Well, that makes it legal. Well, it doesn't, but it makes it look more legal, right? And so in general, when you have a power of attorney, you always want to have it notarized, just so that it looks legal. Um, if you want the attorney to be able to deal with your real estate, language, that language has to be in the power of attorney. If you want the attorney to be able to make gifts on your behalf uh, to anybody, and specifically to, to make gifts to himself or herself, that has to be in the power of attorney. Why is that important? I do a lot of work in the nature of elder law, helping people deal with the possibility of qualifying for mass health. And oftentimes that involves restructuring assets, moving assets from one person's name to another person's name. So if your spouse is in the nursing home, if he or she is in the nursing home, and we're trying to get him or her qualified for mass health by moving all the assets to you and then having you do some things, we can't do that if there's something that is in your spouse's name and no one has a power of attorney that is allowing gifts to be made from your spouse to other people, right? And so that language has to be in there, and, and, and it needs to be kind of very open-ended. The reason why I mention the open-ended is I often see powers of attorney that people think are, all, are great, where the spouses have given powers of attorney to each other or someone's given it to their child. But the power of attorney, which was typically drafted by an attorney who was focusing on financial issues, like minimizing estate taxes or gift taxes, um, will have a clause in there that says that the gift that is made cannot exceed the so-called federal gift tax limit, which I won't go into a lot, but which is this year $14,000. Well, that power of attorney doesn't help me if, if your wife is in the nursing home and we need to shift assets from her to you, the husband, so that we can get her qualified for mass health. If the most she can give away is $14,000 and she's got an IRA or a 401k with $100,000 in it, I can't move it. I can't move it with that power of attorney. So I need a general power of attorney. Um, the person you name in your power of attorney, it can be an individual, and then you can name a successor if that person um, isn't available. Alternatively, you can name more than one person jointly and severally. That's usually what we recommend. Um, you can name a couple of your kids or your spouse and one of your kids jointly and severally. What that means is that either one of them can sign at any time. Or you can name them jointly which means they both have to sign. So if you don't trust them, right? Well, you name two people, right? But often, the joint and several is often a very handy way to deal with that issue, okay? The alternative to a, a power of attorney is a conservatorship. It used to be that guardianships took care of all this, but they don't anymore because of some changes in the law. So you actually, if you don't have a proxy and you don't have a power of attorney, so somebody needs to make your medical decisions and your legal decisions, like your money decisions, they actually have to go through two processes in the probate court. Each one's going to cost about $10,000 and take about several months. So you just don't want to go there, okay? Um, so well, now we'll talk about wills a little bit and about probate. Um, so what's the purpose of, of uh, having a will? It's to make sure that the assets that, that you leave when you die, that you own in your individual names, go to the right people. 
Um, by signing a will, you are not avoiding the probate process. The probate process is the process through which uh, it is figured out, in this case by a probate judge, who owns the things or who's going to get the things that you own when you die in your individual names. Now, if you die without a will, then the, who gets your, whatever you own is already figured out for you. The, the state has basically written a will for you. It's called the rules of intestacy. Um, without going into a lot of detail about that, in this case, Frank and Mary, what they want to do is exactly what the rules of intestacy say. If they're married and they have children and the children are all theirs, so there are no other marriages, right? And one of them dies, the other one gets everything. If the two of them have died, the things get divided equally among the kids. So from Frank and Mary's perspective, as long as that's all they want to have happen and there are no unusual things, they actually don't need a will. And having a will doesn't save them any time because they're still going to have to go through the probate process. Because the first goal of probate is to make sure that the, that the right people get the assets. The second goal, though, is to make sure that before any assets get distributed, your creditors get paid, which is the reason why probate takes so long. Probate has to take at least a year because your creditors have one year from the day that you die to file a claim for, against your estate to make sure they get paid. And therefore, if I'm the personal representative, used to be called the, the administrator or the executor, if I'm the personal representative, I want to make sure that all the creditors are paid before I make any distributions to anybody else. Why? Because if I don't, if I distribute to everybody else, and then a creditor shows up, I am personally liable. I, the personal representative or executor, am personally liable up to 150% of the amount of the probate estate to pay that creditor, right? which is why the estates take a year, right? So the goal for many people, the, the issue is the will doesn't, doesn't solve your, 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 doesn't get you out of probate. Um, and it only covers assets that are in individual names. So going back to the Frank and Mary case, in the Frank and Mary case, those are the assets. If Frank were to die, given this situation, there would be no need for probate because the home and the bank accounts are held jointly, jointly with the rights of survivorship. Legally, what that means is that those assets are owned 100% by both people. I know that sounds nutty, but they're owned 100% by both people, subject to the fact that the other person owns 100% too. So when one person dies, that person's interest legally evaporates at that moment, leaving the other person as the sole owner of the asset. Right? Regarding the IRA and the annuity, those are both items where there will be death beneficiaries. I've never seen an annuity in which you cannot name a death beneficiary. And all IRAs have to have death beneficiaries. And the IRAs, the monies in IRAs or 401ks actually aren't even owned by you, your IRAs and 401ks. You know, you get those bank statements and it looks like you've got all that money, but it always says custodian, right? Because it's the bank or the Fidelity or whoever is actually the owner of that money, but they're taking care of it for you. They're obliged to give it back to you if you ask, and they're required to give it to your death beneficiary if you have, if you have named one, okay? So in this case, as long as Frank has named Mary as the death beneficiary on the IRA and the annuity, um, there will be no probate. Upon Mary's death, though, there would be, because she would have become the sole owner of all of those assets, right? Now, she wouldn't need a will. Um, in the situation that we've talked about because the, if she wants the assets simply divided among the kids and she doesn't care about going through probate, right? Um, so there are a couple of issues though where she may want to consider, um, um, and I'm not going to talk about that, where she may want to consider having a will. Um, if one of the kids has a creditor problem, right? If one of the kids have a, has a marriage problem, um, one of the kids has a disability, or in the case of a house. So the house is special. We'll talk about the other three first. So if you give, if, they, if the Frank and Mary give, a, or Mary gives a lot of her money to, to Mary Jr., but Mary Jr. has a creditor problem, really what she's done is she's given it to the creditor, right? Be, or the IRS, if the Mary's behind in her taxes, because all those people can then go and sue Mary Jr. and go get the money, right? Um, if, there's, if one of them has got a, a lousy marriage and all of a sudden one of them inherits a bunch of money, in this case it would be you know, one third of about $600,000 or $200,000, and then there's a divorce, 
that money is in play in terms of figuring out how the assets are going to get divided up between the two spouses. Um, if one of those kids has a disability and it, it needs to qualify for Mass Health or is already on Mass Health or other government programs like SSI um, that are means tested where you can't qualify if you have too much in assets, then ironically giving them the money may knock them off the, 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 uh, the, the benefit program, right? So in all of those cases, what Mary may want to do is to have a will, and in that will specify that following, her, following uh, her death, the assets that would have gone to that child are instead going to get held in trust for the benefit of that child. Typically in that case, she would name one of her other kids as the trustee for the benefit of that child. And as long as the child whose assets you're trying to protect does not have the right, the legal right, to order a distribution from the trust, as long as the trustee has the discretion to do it, but the beneficiary can't order it, then no creditor or spouse can get to it, and the asset is not counted if that child of yours needs to qualify for a benefit program or is already on a benefit program. Okay? Finally, the house. So if Mary just says in her will, or there's no will, and, and so the, and simply says, the kids get the house or doesn't talk about the house and simply says in, the, in her residuary clause, the clause of the will that says how most stuff gets distributed, that everything gets divided in three. The legal effect of that is that the kids become the owners of the house, all three of them, as tenants in common, which means if any one of them dies, their family gets that asset. Um, but it also means that while they're alive, if anything has to be done regarding that house, like to sell it, right, or to mortgage it, or to decide if one of them can live there, and what the rent is going to be, and who pays the taxes. Everybody's got to agree at all times, all three. It isn't majority rule. And if one of them decides to not pay any money, uh, or decides that they don't want to sell the house because they live in there, or they've been living there for free for many years, and they want to keep living there, there, there are a million permutations on this story, right? Then, and the other kids want to do something, they can't do anything unless they file a petition to partition real estate in court, get a court to order the sale of the proceeds or the sale of the house, and then get a court and then have a trial regarding how the proceeds are going to get divided up. Well, none of that's pretty, right? So if you have the slightest inkling that your kids don't all really get along well, right? Um, then you may think about if you have a house saying it, making sure you have a will and saying in that will the house gets sold and the proceeds get divided as opposed to just giving it to them because that's probably your intention in the first place. Um, it has been my experience that except for vacation properties, I do a lot of work on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Nobody wants to sell a house in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, right? Everybody wants to keep visiting and blah, blah, blah. But for normally, People want to sell the house and divide up the money. And if that's the situation, then you want to, you, you want to have a will that specifies that. Okay? Um, so a common question that I get asked, especially among, um, no, actually really among everybody, is how we can avoid this probate process. Because the probate process, well, I've explained how it works, but it's, it's expensive. It's not hugely expensive, but say it's like five to $10,000. And it's, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's going to take a year. You have to excuse me. Oh, that wasn't an ad. So, and it's going to take about a year. So if you want to avoid that, you want to avoid the attorney's fees. And remember, these aren't attorney's fees that you're going to pay because you're going to be dead, right? But if you want to avoid having your kids have to pay these uh, and have to do that delay, then you may want to try to avoid probate. There are several ways to do it. One, is joint ownership. Remember we talked about that. If you own something jointly, like with your spouse, then upon your death your spouse becomes the instant owner. So typically for married couples who come in and they're worried about probate, I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, you really don't have to worry about this until one of you dies, right? When the, the second one does, because then you've got to figure out the kids and all that jazz, right? But if everything is owned jointly, there's going to be no probate. Um, also you can do this by, in, this is especially applies to real estate, um, by having a life estate in the property. This is a very common device used by folks, among other things, when they're doing mass health related planning, but also if they want to do probate avoidance. The, ch the cheapest way to make sure that upon your death, the, the probate, if your spouse is dead, that, you're, the, that there doesn't need to be a probate, is you do a deed to your kids. 
of the remainder interest in the property. That is, all of the interest in the property starting the moment that you die. You keep a life estate in the property. That is, total control of the property and ownership for as long as you live. So while you're alive, you continue to have to pay the taxes and the insurance. And if you're entitled to an elderly exemption of any kind or a veteran's exemption, you still get it because you're the holder of the, of the life estate. Um, but upon your death, your interest evaporates and the kids become the sole owners of the property, right? Um, by the way, the only, one of the only problems, there are a couple of problems with that, but you know, the good news is it's very inexpensive, right? Because all you're just doing is a, is a deed with the retained life estate, a couple of other little things. Um, and for tax purposes, for, for income tax purposes, it is as if you still own the property. So that if you, no, excuse me, for estate tax purposes, it's as if you still own the property. So when you die, the so-called tax basis of the property jumps to the date of death value so that if your kids then want to sell the house, they're not going to pay any capital gains tax. Um, there are two problems with it. One, I already talked to you about the fact that at this point, your three kids would own the house. So if you think they're going to fight about that, that's not good, right? Um, and you could, you could remedy that, um, and oftentimes people will, by simply by creating an irrevocable trust, uh, a trust that cannot be revoked during your um, during your uh, lifetime. This is if you've got nursing home related issues or a revocable trust. And we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, in order to cause the property to become owned by a, the, a trustee after you die and then take care of the property that way. But the point is there are, the, the other issue with life estate, uh, people often don't know about this part. It, remember, now you, you have all heard that if you sell your home, um, you get a capital gains exemption, and that capital gains exemption is equal to $250,000 if you're single and a $500,000 if you're uh, married. And that's really important if you live around here because property values have gone up a lot, right? If you bought a house around here 30 years ago, right, so worth a lot more money. And in the absence of that exemption, you would be paying a capital gains tax on the difference between what you bought it for and what you sell it for, right? And that capital gains tax totals about 20 to 25% of the capital gain. So if you give your kids a remainder interest and keep a life estate, uh, and then you want to turn around and sell the property, well, you know, you don't own that remainder interest anymore. You only own the life estate. And therefore, your capital gains exemption only applies to your piece, which is typically about 20% of the value of the house. On the rest of the house, there has to be a capital gains tax paid, right? Unless your kids convey their interest back to you and you keep owning it for another two years because you're entitled to the capital gains exemption if you've owned the property, that is all the property, um, and lived in it for, two, for the previous, two out of the previous five years. Um, I guess but while we're there though, I'm gonna mention two other things about life estate, because there, there, there is, you, really, you do need to kind of balance it out. I'll give you two stories. So, um, so I had a lady, these are, both, these are both Martha's Vineyard stories. I had a couple, lived in Oak Bluffs, had moved from Boston many years before. They had a cottage in Oak Bluffs, nice little place. As, at, and at this point worth a boatload, not a boatload of money, half a boatload of money. Um, and they've been living there, retired. Uh, many years ago, they transferred a remainder interest in the house to their kids. So it's been more than five years, so they know that if they needed to qualify for mass health, the house would be safe. Problem is, they don't need to qualify for mass health. They're in their mid-80s, they're still very healthy, but they want to sell their house now and move back to the mainland because it's expensive on Martha's Vineyard and they want to be closer to their grandchildren who are mostly around Boston. And so they called their kids and said, we need you to deed your interest back to us. And two of them did. The other one didn't. And so they, told, they called me. They said, what can we do? I said, nothing. There's nothing you can do. Can't force that person to convey that interest back to you. And without that interest, you can't sell this house. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> they said, what are we going to do? Well, you know, you could go file a petition to partition the real estate and get the house sold, but in that case, you're only gonna be entitled to the piece that's equal to your life estate, which is 20% of the value of your $800,000 house. So you're not gonna be getting nearly what you thought you were gonna get. Well, what if we get a reverse mortgage? You can do that, as long as all the kids are gonna sign on it, because everybody has to sign the reverse mortgage. So they're stuck, right? Another example, I had a lady who was in, in, in Vineyard Haven, actually, um, who called me because she had one child conveyed the remainder interest to her one child, um, kept the life estate, more than five years has passed, the house is safe, 
She's very happy, except she called me because her son just got served with divorce papers by his wife. Do I have a problem? She said, oh yeah, you've got a problem. Because at her age, she's in her 80s, the remainder interest is worth about 80% of the house. In this case, it's about a $600,000 house. And so that piece of the house is going to be part of that divorce uh, in terms of calculating the settlement between her son and the, and the, the soon-to-be ex-wife. So there's some... Re let me put it, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a definitely an alternative. It's the least expensive, but you want to think it out. That's all. So, if you, regarding other stuff, uh, stuff in the house. Never worry about the fact that there's going to need to be a probate regarding stuff in the house. I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. It's just never happened, you know. People just divide up the stuff in the house. Now, if you're the rare person who has a Matisse, you know, in the house, some priceless thing, well, then maybe you want to designate a person who's supposed to be getting that. Right? And maybe in that case you want to have a will that's, because if you have a will and you've left a list of things that you want to be giving to particular kids, then because you have, you, you have a will, the executor of that will is actually bound by that list um, if they find that list within 30 days of the date of your death. So if, if that's an issue for you, then you can do it that way. But typically people just write out a list or just say to the kids, you know, figure it out. One remaining thing regarding avoiding probate is your car. Cars are the, are the single most common reason why people inadvertently get stuck doing probate. Because if you die owning your car, if, you're, if there's a spouse, it is, there's a law that presumes that the spouse becomes the owner of the car. If there is no spouse, though, there's a problem. And the only way to solve it is by doing something in probate court. So if you want to avoid that, you need to name somebody else as the joint owner with you on that car. So that upon your death, your interest expires, they become the sole owner. Um, one other possibility, as I had mentioned, is to create a trust. If Mary and Frank, or Mary alone, wants to keep control of her house while she's alive, doesn't want to have to deal with her kids, but wants to avoid probate, she can create a revocable and amendable trust. One that she's got total control over, name herself as the trustee, the legal owner, for the benefit of the beneficiaries, who would be herself and her kids. But she has no obligation to give the kids anything. But she says right in the trust, if I die, I'm naming one of the kids, or more than one, as the successor trustee. If she does that regarding the house or regarding any asset that she has, like regarding the bank accounts, for example, then upon her death, the successor trustee can immediately step in and immediately sell the property and divide it up and do whatever she has instructed them to do through the trust. Um, remember, a revocable trust is totally under Mary's control, and therefore for tax purposes it doesn't exist. It doesn't affect her capital gain status if she sells the house. It doesn't affect the step up in basis when she dies. It's as if, she does, it is as if the trust doesn't exist. Also, for mass health purposes, it's as if the trust doesn't exist. Those assets that are in the revocable trust are all still Mary's. If she needs to qualify for mass health, she needs to deal with them as if they were still hers. The reason why I emphasize this is many younger people, you know, your definition of younger changes, right, as you get old. So many people like under 75, right, will talk to me and they're not really worried about nursing home care very much. So they're really not worried about that kind of planning um, because they know if you're, if you're 65, for example, your chances of having Alzheimer's during your lifetime are one in nine. If you're 85, your chances are one in three. So the older you get, the more you start worrying about the fact you're one of the ones that may get hit with the nursing home issue. So, so oftentimes people will tr come in and they'll structure things so as to avoid probate by doing these revocable and amendable trusts. Time goes by, nobody looks at the legal documents, now they're in their 80s, somebody's got dementia, one of the, you know, somebody comes in, oh, what, you know, this, the house is safe, right? It's in trust. Well, no, it's in the wrong trust, right? It's in a revocable and amendable trust, which means, as far as mass health is concerned, the parents still own the house, right? And the house is still countable. So you, if, it, you, the, the kind of trust you use, or whether you want one, depends on what your goal is. There isn't like, people often come in and say, I want it, I think I need a trust. And I'll say, well, why is that? Well, because my neighbor said, they've got one. Or one of my kids said, I heard it on the radio, you have to have a trust. Well, you know, the question is, like, why do you, why do you need it, okay? Finally, Mass Health 101. Um, of most interest, as I had mentioned, to people who are worried about um, protecting their assets in the event that somebody needs nursing home care 
or needs a lot of care at home in order to stay out of a nursing home. Um, because if you can show that medically you are eligible for a nursing home because you either need at least help with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring. Transferring means getting out of a chair, walking across a room, and sitting down again. Uh, if you need help, physical help, another p person to help you with at least two of those, or if you need constant supervision because you've got a dementia problem, um, then you're eligible not only for nursing home care, but also for this other program called the Frail Elder Waiver, which is a program which will pay, through which MassHealth will pay for up to about 50 hours a week of home care to keep you from going to a nursing home. Okay, so the, but the question in all cases is, are you financially eligible? So here's MassHealth 101. Well, back to Frank and Mary, those are their assets, right? So they get 625,000 in assets, there's the house, there's the other stuff, there's their income. So if Mary needs nursing home care today, and those are their assets, um, how many people think, here think she can qualify for Mass Health quickly without having to spend down a lot of the assets? Raise your hand if you think she can qualify for Mass Health. Nobody, you're all wrong, she can. Now the reason for that is because of Frank because Frank's still alive. And while Mary cannot have more than $2,000 in assets in order to qualify for MassHealth, Frank can own the house as long as it has an equity of less than $840,000. So you can own a big house, right? Um, around here. You go to Nantucket, nobody's house is worth that little <laughs> anymore. This is really an a problem on, on Nantucket. Um, so Mary can transfer the house to Frank, right? She can transfer her other assets to Frank, and by the way, you can transfer assets to a spouse anytime. There's no look back period regarding transfers to a spouse. So you can literally do that the day before you apply for MassHealth. And then, now Frank's got all these assets. And remember the total, the total value is $325,000. So he can't have assets of more than $119,220 and still qualify for MassHealth. However, he can have unlimited income, unlimited income. And so all he has to do in this case is take the rest of the money, save the money over 100000 and go buy a certain kind of annuity. An annuity which can't be cashed in, because otherwise it would have a surrender value and that would be an asset, but which calls for an income stream over a term. It has to be a fixed term. It can't even be for his life. It has to be a fixed term. And that term has to be shorter than his actuarial life expectancy. So if, if uh, Frank in this case is 80 years old, his life expectancy is about 10 years. If he's 89, his life expectancy is four years. Every year that you live, your life expectancy shrinks by about nine months. It doesn't shrink by a year. That's why those, the numbers kind of don't come out. So if you're 101, you actually have a life expectancy of two years. Um, so Frank buys that annuity, calling for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, and now and thereby causes his assets to meet the criteria. His house is worth less than $840,000. His cash is worth less than $119,220. His income doesn't make any difference. Mary qualifies for, for Mass Health the next day. Once she's qualified, she's going to have to pay her income to the nursing home, and that's $750. You may remember from an earlier slide, her only income is her Social Security check, right? All the rest, Mass Health is going to pay. What happens, though, if Frank dies? Well, if we get this taken care of ahead of time, right? Whoops. If we get this taken care of ahead of time, or if Frank at, the, at this point does all of this stuff, and if he, has, if he has a will that says, when I die, everything that I would have left to my spouse, and because remember that was his goal, their goal was if one dies, everything is going to go to the other. If his will instead says, everything I would have left to my spouse, I am instead going to leave in trust for the benefit of my spouse, and I'm going to name one of my kids or all of my kids as the trustees, then all the assets that he owns at the time of his death will immediately be safe if his wife needs to qualify for mass health. And even in this case, if his wife is already on mass health, if he, if he, if he tr has the house in just his name, this cash in just his name, and a will that says that upon his death everything goes in trust for her benefit, then upon his death all these assets remain safe, not lienable, right, and not countable. What he would also do in that case, under current Mass Health rules, is he would name um, that, tr that, that testamentary trust that's in his will as the death beneficiary 
for his annuity so that if he dies and there are any more annuity payments to be made, those go right into the, uh, into the pot and are immediately safe. Okay? Under the current rules, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I mentioned the fact the rules may be changing. Right? Under the current rules, Frank can literally name the kids or this trust as the death beneficiary for any remaining annuity payments. There is one of the proposed changed rules, if it changes, will be that if Frank buys that annuity in this situation, he's got to name Mass Health as the primary beneficiary as to any remaining payments if he dies and there are still payments to be made. Right? So that's going to be a real change. It's going to change some of our planning. It's also going to make, make it so that what you'd really want to do in this situation, if you're Frank, is buy a really short annuity so that you get your money back fast. By the way, one thing kind of parenthetically regarding all of this, remember I gave you that magic number that, that Frank can have, cannot have more than $120,220 in assets. Well, if he buys a short annuity, he's going to be getting money really fast in monthly payments. Um, so the question is, well, isn't he soon going to go over that number? And the answer is, it doesn't make any difference once Mary has qualified for Mass Health. So the reason why I had mentioned here, in this case, he'd only take out an annuity for like 100,000, he'd keep 100,000 as opposed to keeping 120, is he'd want to factor in the fact that while he's going through the application process with Mary, he's going to start getting these annuity payments. And he wants to make sure they don't pile up so that he ends up with more than $120,220 before she qualifies. Because the day after she qualifies, he could hit the lottery. It doesn't make any difference how much money he has the day after she qualifies for Mass Health. Okay? Um, regarding the plan that I just described to you, you cannot do probate avoidance and do this kind of asset protection at the same time. So if Frank and Mary came in to me today, and neither of them is in the nursing home, but they want to make sure that if one of them dies, the assets are safe, I'll tell them the only way you can do that is by changing your will to have this provision in it that says that upon your death, everything that you die owning is going to go in trust for the benefit of your spouse. And then you have to make sure that when you die, everything is just in your name. Now, because things are just in your name, that means when you die, they have to go through probate. And they have to go through probate so they can end up in that testamentary trust, the trust that is part of the will. There is no way that you can do probate avoidance and asset protection for spouses at the same time. <clears throat> Um, so we talked about this. So their asset protection plan, if be even before, if they were not worried about nursing home care right, right now, but they were just trying to plan for the future, would be to have wills done that have these asset protection trusts, um, have powers of attorney done, so that if one of them gets sick, it will be easy to be, even if they're both sick, to be moving assets around to make sure that the spouse who dies first ends up with all the assets in their name, right? And then for some folks, uh, if there is a significant age difference between the spouses, if one is much older than the other, or if one spouse they, they feel has a, has a much greater chance of just dropping dead, which is very rare now that people just drop dead. Remember when we were kids, you know, you hear somebody had a heart attack and they died. Somebody had a stroke and they died. It practically like never happens now, right? They, something happens and the EMT comes and they go to the hospital. And they live for a little while, right? So usually there's time to do shifting, asset shifting, at the last minute, right? If you're worried about that, though, well, then you stack all of the assets in the name of the person who might die suddenly. Um, if Frank is dead, though, and Mary has inherited all the assets, and they don't have time, to, and, they, and they, so they no longer have this option, then Mary's options are more limited. There are Mary's assets. Now she owns everything. What can she do? Um, she can, give a, she can give away the house, right, and wait five years. Because remember, if you're giving an asset to anybody other than your spouse, then that gift is, does not protect the asset until, in, unless it's been given away and five years have gone by before you're applying for mass health. So she could give away the house completely, except if she does that, then she's giving her kids her tax basis in the house, what she bought it for, right? And so when they go to sell the house, even if she's still alive, they're going to pay a, capital gain, a big capital gains tax. What she'd probably instead do is make a gift but retain a life estate. We already talked about that, either to the kids themselves or to a trustee for the benefit of the kids. Uh, in this case, the trust would need to be an irrevocable trust, an, a trust in which she can't get the asset back and she's not a beneficiary. <clears throat> because 
if she can get the asset back, like in the case of the revocable trust, the asset still counts. Um, regarding other assets, once again, she can just gift them to her kids. She can set up this trust, and which, is, uh, which you know, will often get done, that there will be a, an irrevocable trust created with one of the kids named as the trustee for the benefit of all the kids. And then Mary would put some money in there, right? And then later, if she needs the money, she is hoping that because the kids are named as the beneficiaries and the child in one of the kids is a trustee, that the trustee will distribute the money to, the benef to one of the kids, other kids, and then they'll give it back to her. But you gotta trust them, right? As they say, that's why they call them trusts because you've got to trust the trustee. And that's one of the reasons why often people will not do this regarding their cash because they just, they can't bear the thought of losing control of their cash, right? They'll often be willing to do it regarding their house because they'll realize regarding their house, well, you know, I can kind of give it away and keep it because I can keep a life estate in the house so I can keep using the house while at the same time knowing that five years after I've made this transfer, the rest of the value in the house is safe, right? So th th it's kind of a balancing act, but those are the questions that Mary has to act if they haven't, if she didn't do the planning with Frank and get the assets restructured before Frank died. Uh, Mary's asset protection plan can also avoid probate for the reasons I just suggested. If she's transferring assets now by keeping a life estate and giving away a remainder interest, as we talked about, upon her death, her life estate evaporates, the house becomes owned by the kids, no probate. If she transfers her assets now, to an irrevocable trust, to the trustee of an irrevocable trust, upon her death, she doesn't own that asset. And therefore, there's no need for probate. So you can actually, she can actually do this planning while at the same time avoiding probate. Uh, we already talked about that. One other thing, finally. If Mary hasn't done any of this, and she goes into a nursing home, and the kids come in to me, and they go, oh my God, do we have to spend on all the money? You know, she didn't do any planning at all. My, we're dying. We kept telling her to do it. She didn't do anything. What I'll tell them is, well, you can't save all the money now, but you can still save some, probably. And the reason is because what you may not realize, if you go to a nursing home today, for nursing homes around here, the, your, your private pay cost is going to be order of magnitude. Twelve to fourteen thousand dollars a month, around that, right? Let's say it's let's say it's let's say it's fourteen thousand a month, just because it's easier for me to do the math in this case. Um, that same bed in that same nursing home, if you've qualified for Mass Health, right? The Mass Health rate for that bed is about seven thousand dollars a month. Now that rate varies from nursing home to nursing home, but in general, that's about a safe. That's a safe figure. <clears throat> no matter what the private pay rate was, you can have a nursing home where the private pay rate was ten thousand, or where the private pay rate was fifteen thousand. Typically, the Mass Health rate for that bed is seven thousand dollars a month. And if Mass Health pays for that, and what Mass Health will do is they will pay the difference between the income of the person, right, the Social Security income of the person, which is, which has to be paid to the nursing home, and the Mass Health. Caught, and, and, and whatever the mass health and whatever it is that gets you to the mass health rate. So in the Mary case, if, if Frank had died and leaving Mary with an income of $750 a month, I'm going to round that up to 1,000, right? Um, say that she had, oh, no, excuse me, suppose Frank died, suppose, we'll just suppose, suppose Frank died, suppose his income were 2,000 a month from Social Security. So now Frank's dead, so now that's Mary's income, $2,000 a month from Social Security. And suppose she's in that nursing home bed on private pay. The burn rate, the rate at which her savings are going to have to get ex used in order to keep her in that bed is $14,000 a month, which is the nursing home rate, minus the $2,000 a month, which is her income. If, on the other hand, she qualifies for mass health, right? At that point, the bed rate becomes $7,000. Her income, if she's on Mass Health, continues to have to be paid to the nursing home, $2,000 a month. But suddenly, the gap, the amount by which her, her money is burning down, has gone from uh, $7,000, from what, $12,000 a month, to $5,000 a month. Because the, that, the amount is seven, the $7,000 Mass Health rate minus her $2,000 her income. 
So if she can cause herself to be qualified for MassHealth, even if MassHealth ends up with a lien on her property to get repaid whatever the money is that they've paid, she's saving a boatload of money because the amount that MassHealth is going to get repaid is only $5,000 a month. The amount that she would have paid out of pocket to keep herself in that nursing home, that, that, that burn rate would have been $12,000 a month. So she ends up saving $7,000 a month just by being on Mass Health, which leads to the question, can she do that? Because remember, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, for her to qualify for Mass Health, she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. The answer to that question is, yes, she can, in two ways. One, by buying an annuity. Remember I talked about the fact that by buying an annuity, you can cause an asset to turn into an income stream. The other is by using a so-called D4C pooled trust. We're going to talk about that just for a second. Those are the two rules. Let's see if I got any more slides. No, I don't. So I'm going to, I'm going to be talking about these a lot more at the next presentation because I'm going to be talking about how it is that you qualify for mass health now and what these new, how these new rules would affect you. But basically, under the, under the new rule, under the current rules, Mary, remember Mary had a house worth $300,000, but remember, she can, oh, she can qualify for mass health and still own that house, as long as it has equity of, uh, equity of less than $840,000, except that mass health puts a lien on it, right, to make sure they get repaid following her death, which means she can qualify for mass health as long as she gets rid of all of her cash. She had $325,000 in cash. Um, one way would be to drop all of this money into a so-called D4C pooled trust. There are, these are trusts operated by nonprofits. There are five of them in Massachusetts. The money that you put into the pooled trust gets held by them, invested, pooled with all their other money, and invested and reinvested. That's why they call them pooled trusts. But then the money can be used to supplement Mary's care for the rest of her life, to buy better furniture for the nursing home, or a wheelchair, or if she's still got her house, while she's in the nursing home to pay the expenses of operating that house, right? Because she's not going to have any money to pay the taxes and the insurance. So it can do a lot of stuff. Now Mass Health is going to have a lien on that money so that they can get repaid whatever they paid on Mary's behalf during her lifetime. But the lien is only going to accrue, as we talked about, at $5,000 a month, right? So at the end of a year, there will be an accrued lien of 5 times 12 or $60,000. If Mary had been on private pay, remember, her burn rate on her savings would have been $12,000 a month, $14,000 minus her $2,000 in income. So at the end of a year, she would have spent $144,000. So now you get the sense of the reason why you always want to qualify for mass health. And you can do that right now by just dropping all your money into the D4C. Under one of the proposed rules changes or regulation changes, you won't be able to do that anymore. Um, because MassHealth is going to start imposing the five-year look-back period on transfers into the D4C. Um, annuities. You can also cause that money to turn into an income stream by simply buying an annuity. Mary could take her $325,000 and buy an annuity with it, thereby causing her to become the recipient of monthly payments from that annuity of $3,000, $4,000 a month, right? The day after she buys the annuity, thereby getting her remaining cash below $2,000, she's on mass health. If the annuity combined with, in the, in, the, in the optimum case, if the annuity combined with her regular Social Security check of $2,000 adds up to $7,000 a month, and if the mass health bed rate for that bed is $7,000 a month, that means there is no lien that accrues. There's no lien because mass health isn't actually paying any money to the nursing home. Mary is effectively just living in the same bed, in the same nursing home, for $7,000 a month less, right? Now, this will also be affected by proposed change in the MassHealth regulations in that MassHealth will be saying that only annuities from commercial insurance companies are allowed. Today, you could actually do this, play this annuity game with your relatives. You could actually have one of your relatives give you an annuity in return for giving them all the money. But once again, we're going to talk about that more um, in a couple months. So, I know they covered a lot of material. <laughs> um, if, if, if you want to see this again, um, my friends Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. It's called Elder Law Frank and Mary, so you can go watch this again. Um, um, and otherwise, um, and also you can also call me anytime. I'm glad to answer any questions. I don't never charge for advice. The goal of all of this is peace of mind. As I say, once you get to be our age, the goal is no longer fame and fortune. It's getting a good night's sleep. So if this 
helps you sleep well at night, then um, this was worth the presentation. Any questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you, if you get a chance, I hope you come to the, to the next one. Or if you got any questions, let me know. Or, or, or watch Frank and Mary's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you.